Hi, and welcome to Ed Talks. My name is Anne Diamond, and I'm a Board of Governors Teaching Chair here at the University of Lethbridge. I want to start by saying that we are here on Treaty 7 lands, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people. So I also want to say Oki Nitsu Kuawa, which means welcome to our friends and family in Blackfoot. It's my pleasure to introduce my guest here today, Dr. Harold Jansen. Harold is a full professor in the Department of Political Science and Associate Dean in the Faculty of Arts and Science. He's here today as this Distinguished Teaching Award winner and also has been the recipient of numerous teaching awards over the years. He's been the Student Union uh, Teaching winner of the Teaching Excellence Award. Is that right, Harold? That's correct, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And he's been on the McLean's list of favorite teachers at the university, as well as numerous other um, teaching things, like you were also the Board of Governors Teaching Chair, so you've done these ed talks. So let me start by saying welcome, Harold. Um, Thanks, and congratulations. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I was pretty excited given the number of amazing teachers at this university. It's a real honor to be chosen for that. It's one of yeah. my favorite things about being involved with the Teaching Center. You get to interact with people who are also committed to teaching, and there's so many of them. Yeah, and I find everyone kind of pushes each other to be better, and I always go to teaching center events, and I always come away with about 20 more ideas than I could actually reasonably try in the classroom, <laughs> but it's always getting me thinking of ways to be better or be more creative. Right, I, I, uh, it, that is my experience as well. Um, so I gave you a kind of traditional um, introduction there of mm -hmm. how we often do in academics, but I wanted to um, ask you to give a, a different story of how you got here. We often talk about how we got here as researchers, right. um, but could you tell me about your teaching background? How did you get to be the teacher you are? I guess I've always been teaching. My parents tell me when I was a kid, I used to play, pretend to be a teacher all the time. <laughs> yeah, they were telling me that after I won the award, so I thought that was quite funny. But if I had to look at sort of the formal beginning, but it actually kind of began in high school. Mm -hmm. I had a grade 11 chemistry teacher who was not the best chemistry teacher that one could imagine. I think he was really out of his depth. I think he was more of an English teacher who got roped into teaching <laughs> chemistry. So uh, several of the students in the class were floundering. So we had a, many of us had a spare. It was right before chemistry class, if I remember, in grade 11. So I actually ended up holding impromptu chemistry 20 tutorial <laughs> sessions where I basically, I could figure it out and I taught right. several of my classmates that. And then I went to a uh, small liberal arts college, uh, mm -hmm. the King's University in, in Edmonton, and it was very tiny at the time. So they didn't have uh, degrees at that time or mm -hmm. senior programs. This was 35 years ago. So I got to be a TA for, uh, I took first year chemistry just as a science requirement. And then um, in my second year, I got to TA chemistry labs and do help sessions. I did that in my third year as well, so I was in front of the classroom. And then uh, when I was finishing up my BA at the University of Alberta, I did a first year history class and I TA'd through grad school. So pretty much all my adult life, I've really been teaching in one way, shape, or form. So mm -hmm. it's, it's part of who I am. Um, well, and I think that shows from the list of things, uh, the, of accomplishments you've had around teaching. Um, for me, I first became aware of your teaching as the guy who flipped the classroom. Um, you're known around campus as someone who's experimented with flipped classroom. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me about that? I mean, let me, and maybe we should start with a kind of basic explanation of what is a flipped classroom? What does that mean? So a flipped classroom is where we flip what we usually do. So the traditional mode of instruction is in class, we lecture, right? right. So mm -hmm. professor stands in front of the class, we spew out pearls of wisdom, connected by lots of filler, and students <laughs> write them down, and then they come back for exams and mm -hmm. fill all that back out. But we often assign papers and assignments and other work that they do on their own time. But the realization of the full classroom is that's a really poor use of our time together when we're in class, because there's lots of other ways to have content where people are listening to something. So the sort of traditional way to do a flipped classroom is to do that one-way delivery of content through video. And so in their own time, the students watch videos or read or do other things to get that content. And we use the time in class for more active learning. So um, I first read about this. I was on study leave and I was supposed to be researching. And of course I was, actually I was reading Wired magazine. I remember that and I was, I read an article about flip classroom in a Wired magazine article. Yeah. And it dawned on me that I was having trouble in my research methods class where I'm teaching statistics to political science students who many of whom took political science because they don't like math and they right. don't want to do math and then suddenly I'm making them do math and uh -huh. they were doing very poorly at that. 
And it was this epiphany that maybe this was the way to uh, do this. So um, I went and uh, produced a bunch of videos that explained the statistical concepts. And then so the idea is the students watch those videos before coming to class and then in class I give them a lab that they work mm -hmm. on and then I circulate and can help them one on one. And the labs are designed to um, start easy and then they get a little more complex as they go along. There are certain stumbling blocks that I kind of introduce to push them a little further. Right. And I expect they're going to run into trouble and need help and then I can explain something one on one with them or if something wasn't clear in the video, um, then I can help them. So we use that for much more hands on active learning the time in class. And what's nice about that is a lot of times when students really need you around is when they're working on their own, right? Is when they're doing the assignment. Exactly. Right. So I'm there when they need me, um, not just sitting there listening. So it's an attempt to try to be more active, but also to make me available to them at times that are more beneficial uh -huh. for their learning. That seems like an amazing thing for an instructor to do for a bunch of different reasons to mm -hmm. me. It, it certainly it makes you available to the students in ways mm -hmm. that are... Uh, very cognizant of their needs, but I, I am surprised by how much work it takes up front, and by the commitment that takes from you. Was it a lot of work? It was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, I started this, and so I started producing these videos in the labs, and I was spending twenty to twenty five hours a week uh, producing the video because I did uh -huh. it all on my own, and I I made animations, and I did all wow. like I. I dove in and there were times about halfway through this course but I'd gone so far down uh, that I yeah, couldn't yeah, back out stop. anymore. <laughs> right. uh, but there were times where I seriously regretted having done this. Uh -huh. um, but what made it so rewarding was seeing the much quicker level of proficiency in my students and uh -huh. how well they were learning, the sophistication of what they were trying. So the very last assignment in this class I basically give them these pre-canned labs where they learn different techniques with data and then at the end I sort of cut them loose and I give them this big data set. And what I found this time, for the, the first time I did it, is I actually had to rein them back. They were almost being too ambitious. Uh -huh. I'd made them almost overly confident, which was right. a really nice problem because I always felt I had to push them to do something that wasn't just a simple a look at a relationship between two variables, calculate a mean or something. Yeah. Um, so I was very excited to see that and then on the final exam for the class, the same kind of final, they did, all did about 10% better on that part. So I saw a tangible demonstration about how much better they were learning. So that was all worth it at the end. But yeah, it was a huge investment uh -huh. up front. Now what's been nice about it is the next year I did it, I re-edited some of the right. videos and fixed some things. And I update the labs regularly when there's new data that comes out just to make uh -huh. them a little more contemporary and interesting. But So that upfront work has paid off over the years. Right. But, yeah, that first year, that was, uh, uh -huh. there were several times I regretted having gone I, down that path. I can imagine. I mean, knowing the end, but at the beginning, you you didn't I, know. And I didn't know yeah. if it was going to yeah. work for sure by all the research I had done in yeah. reading the literature on this, because I, I looked at some of the academic literature on this. Was there actually a solid basis for this besides a cool article in Wired magazine? Right. And I found, yeah, there was good reason to suspect this would work, but... I mean, I hadn't done it, and uh -huh. this was new territory for me. Would I do it effectively? That I wasn't sure of. Well, in terms of making it effective, one of the things that seems that you must have encountered is that students don't actually do the prep work. Yeah. So how, you, how do you deal with that? Well, so I tell them, you have to watch the video before coming to class. Mm -hmm. And when you come to class for the lab, I'm just going to say, okay, the lab's there. Go to it. I'm not going to explain it to you. And they don't quite believe me the first time, but then when I'm actually there and no, I really don't explain it to them, uh -huh. they learn pretty quickly that <laughs> if they don't watch the video, they are, they're stuck. They're right. not gonna, they're, they're gonna be in trouble. And there's often when they raise their hands and ask me a question, I can tell pretty quickly and I'll ask them, did you actually watch the video? Uh -huh. And uh, no, I'll say, well, you really need to, or this is not gonna be a very productive use of our of time. either of our times, so right. you really need to do that. And after the first week or two, they, they're pretty good about it, actually. They, they learn quickly that they need to do it. And it's funny sometimes, because one of the real benefits of a flipped classroom is uh, when you're sitting in a lecture, you, if you miss something the first time, you're, you're kind of stuck by what right. your notes are. Yes. But if you were kind of zoned out for a minute, they may not be accurate, but my students uh -huh. can always go back and rewatch things. So right. if they're doing an assignment that needs a particular kind of technique and they're stuck, I don't remember how to do that, they can just go back, find that video, fast forward to the part where I, oh, okay, now I see uh -huh. 
how to do that. So the fact that they can always go back to see things is also a very helpful is beneficial for them. Benefit so for them. if they yeah. do miss a week and get behind, they, they can catch they can up always catch up, and ways. it's always there, and it's there for uh -huh. the final exam. And a lot of them rewatch it because I can get viewer statistics, so I can actually see how often they're being viewed. And in your discipline, are there normally labs? No, generally only in things like research methods, right? Um, where we do things like that. So right. yeah, it's a bit bit unusual for us to do that. But I teach the more empirical sides of political science. So I, I, I took this class over because no one else really wanted to do it. And uh, it's tough, usually methods classes, like I said, students come in, I'll ask them just to be really honest, how many of you are here because you have to? And 90% of them are only taking it because it's required for the degree. Right. And if they had any choice about it, they would not be uh -huh. here. And so and I've, I view that as the ultimate teaching challenge in my career right. is how can I make this work for students and help them learn something they do not want to learn. Uh -huh. So I'm interested in that you have empirical evidence mm -hmm. around the shift. Have you tracked that over time? I have, yeah. And I, I always, I'm very interested. I always look very closely. I calculate separate numbers for different parts of the exam and I can look uh -huh. over time. Um, and yeah, generally that's held. They've done better okay. under this method. I do see some slight differences from year to year, but that, there's always that's variation right. depending how strong or relatively weak a particular class is. Right. Um, where I'm really working, about half of my class is statistics, the other half is various other kinds of active learning. And I'm trying to flip that with more or less success in some of the other things because to do a flipped classroom effectively requires a lot of planning. Like those activities mm -hmm. you do in class have to be very well structured, right. very well thought through. And uh, that can be challenging actually to design. Yes. And I'm always iterating that class. I've never taught it the same twice. And I've taught that class for over 20 years. I've wow. never taught it the same way uh -huh. uh, twice. I didn't realize that the flipped classroom was maybe more of what we would call mixed methods. Do you mean that it's part of it is flipped and then other parts are not flipped? Well, for flipped? me, so you can flip the entire class, but yeah. for this part of it, it just it made a lot of sense right. for me. But there's other parts of it where it'll be more where I might talk for half an hour, uh -huh. but then we'll do an activity. Right. So I teach how to design a survey, for example. It's an important research skill for political scientists. Uh -huh. So I'll have them read stuff in the textbook, and then I'll talk briefly to hit some high points, and then okay at your tables now here, write these kinds of questions right. and then we'll share them with each other, criticize each other's questions, uh -huh. what worked, what didn't, how could people misunderstand this. Right. Uh, so I, we do a lot of active learning in there, but I wouldn't consider that necessarily a flipped classroom because yeah. I didn't go through the trouble of creating a video. And it's something I want to do right. still as I more and more want to create videos for the whole class, but freeing up those 20 to 25 hours a week right. has it's, now become yeah. more and more of an issue. Right. Because I was imagining it was flipped for the whole year, to me, one of the biggest benefits I've found about moving to more active models, and my classes are still largely lecture, mm -hmm. but more active um, than they used to be, uh, the, the sort of student cohort model is, I find, really a strength of that active. Yeah. And maybe it goes back to your high school experience. I, well, <laughs> I've noticed that, too, because in this class, if I have a, this class typically has 30 to 40 students and I circulate and I usually have a TA that helps me, but there's a lot of times where there's six hands up and there's only mm -hmm. two of us. So I'll tell them if you're stuck, you can ask the person next to you and work right. on it together. And I find the tables where they work together, they form quite a bond actually. Absolutely. And I've seen some of those classes where people have sat with these other students and they end up um, staying together for a very, very long time. Like they become friends all through University and the, years, and the final yeah. exam for that class is very funny because they moved to a completely different class, classroom. But they still sit with the groups they <laughs> right. sit at with the tables, uh -huh. which is really funny. Yeah. Seeing the bonds and I always tease them that it's a bit of they've done statistics together, so they're like war buddies and <laughs> yeah, they've yeah, been through like, this traumatic experience, yeah. clung together and gotten through it, <laughs> right. so they're bonded for life. Uh huh. But I think that's a. Uh, a real strength of the model. Right? Oh, absolutely. That, that they get to know each other, right? Because yeah. you're working side by side rather than all sitting side by side yeah. receiving the same information. And often I find that if a student is feeling confident and explains it to their buddy, mm -hmm. and then the buddy asks a question, and then the student realizes, oh, I, I didn't quite actually understand that part, right? Like it, it, it solidifies the learning. In oh, a lot absolutely. Of ways. Teaching yeah. things, I mean, that's what I found for me. That was one of the things I realized in yeah. grade 11 with chemistry right. by teaching it to other people helped me learn Absolutely. better yeah. as well. Now, the, the thing that I, I did some research on in this class, though, that concerned me is sometimes um, if 
the, the table becomes too solidified and feels like a group, mm -hmm. we run into free rider problems where students are more concerned in the lab about getting the right answer than uh -huh. they are about really understanding why that answer is right. right. And so that's an issue sometimes if the group becomes too strong. And I did some research on this and did okay. a presentation at the university's teaching conference on this, how group work can sometimes actually inhibit individual student learning. So that's sort of the flip side of this right. that I have to watch for. Oh, that's really interesting. I, I would have liked to have heard that presentation. Yeah, it was, it was uh, intriguing because that, that year I really focused on trying to make sure at the table I did a survey of all of them, what group styles they, they like. Like, did you like being a leader? Do you like uh -huh. doing this? I tried to make sure there were leaders at each table. I tried to make sure there was somebody who had some previous statistics experience. I tried to make sure there weren't too many people who absolutely hated math at any one table. Uh -huh. But they really felt because of this very deliberate approach I took to groups that they had to stay in their groups and do things together oh. as groups. Uh -huh. But the thing that was problematic for them is those labs are worth 2% each week. They're not worth a lot of their grade. But the final exam, the stats part on it, is probably worth about 10 to 15% of their final grade. So they're so focused on getting 100% on the thing that's worth a really tiny part of yeah. their grade that they lose sight of the fact that when it comes to the exam, you're not going to have your friends to fall right. back on. It's very important that you understand why. So okay. I've had to sort of de-emphasize that group work a little bit and very much stress to them that you need to understand and it's better to do badly on a lab and then come see me and I'll explain and it to it. you. Yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Treat this as a formative assessment, not a summative one, right? That it's something that's gonna diagnose what you know and what you don't know mm -hmm. in preparation to move forward. Yeah, and that distinction between formative and summative is so important, but often, um, I mean, often we don't treat formative assessments as formative in some sense, right? No, because, absolutely, yeah. Um, so. And I do actually, like it's, it's formative, but I actually do count it towards their grade. So it's But I'm worried that yes. if I don't count it towards their grade, they won't do it, uh -huh. but I try to make it worth as little as I possibly right. can so it doesn't penalize them too much if they do badly on it. Right. And I strongly encourage them to come see me in my office. If you don't understand something, if you do badly, and I'll actually even email students, like you did very badly on this, please come see me. Yes. I will explain it to you again. We'll go through it. Uh -huh. and I've fired up my copy of my stats program in my office. We sit side by side and go through it. But it's up to the students to take me up on that. And not as many of them do that as they should. There's a whole bunch of things I want to follow up with there. But I want to go back to the formative and summative mm -hmm. difference. Um, the idea that formative um, should come with low penalties, right? Yeah. That if it's a learning assignment, it should come with, with low penalties. Um, and then the final summative mm -hmm. response is what they've actually learned over the year, I think is important. And so I've also experimented with how to get the best out of that. So in a, an assignment that builds over the course of a term, like let's say a writing assignment, I experimented with trying to say, oh, it's worth you know 1%. And then I found people did a poor job on it, right? right? Yep. I've not quite solved that. I've experimented with basically deciding before I teach a class that I will say after they've contributed something that if they do better on the next, I'll give them the higher of the two grades. But if you put that in the syllabus, right. so anyway, so I, I, do are, feel, how do you feel about well, me lying to students? <laughs> <laughs> students are very strategic, right? I, yes, I, as I, they I, need to be. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah. They've got a lot of demands. They, mm -hmm. Many of them are besides taking four or five classes or working on the side, and they have to be very strategic about their use of time. Yes. And they will respond to the incentives you give them. Yes. So that's a tricky, <laughs> I don't know the answer to that, and it differs from class to class, yes. assignment to assignment. Yeah, it's um, I try, and it's almost trial, trial and error. And uh -huh. Um, I'm okay sometimes if you have to not be entirely forthcoming, but the <laughs> problem is they also talk to right. each other, right? Yes. Oh, oh yeah, last oh, yeah, year no, she did this. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, so that's a tricky part, especially at a small university. <laughs> right. Word of mouth spreads very quickly. Yes, I, yeah, I, so think, I, I think I they have know that, that about me. I have that struggle as well. Uh -huh. It's where do you strike that balance to yeah. make it worth their while to do, but not so punitive that they can't recover from it. So. Right. Right. Uh, yeah. I'm, and that they take it seriously, but then you reward them if yeah. they do learn it in the end, yeah. right? I, yeah. So it's what I find balance. on the labs and the average is probably about 80%, which is like, really high. high. And yeah. I, I'm fine with that, right? It's as long as they're learning, as yeah. long as they actually know why they're, why they're getting the answer they are and, mm -hmm. and working together in that group if they're asking somebody. And the other thing I like is students are very individual. Some of them 
want to just be left alone, right? right? And yes. I don't make them do it in a group, and some of yeah. them are very solitary and very focused and won't ask anybody. Yeah. Other people like to always talk it through, and I'm, I, I always tell uh -huh. them, it's your learning, and you all have different ways of doing this. Do what works for you. I just want you right. to learn it. I'm not very particular in how you get there. Right. I think that's a really important part of good teaching, respecting that they have different mm -hmm. needs. Like That's why, for me, participation marks are always uh, so double-edged because oh, you want yeah. them to participate, yeah. but you want them to participate in a way that's comfortable for them. Well, and I was what I find I feel like a total hypocrite in uh -huh. uh, discussion <laughs> classes because I was that really quiet student. Yeah. I remember taking a philosophy class, and I never said a single thing right. the entire term. And there were all these philosophy majors who would go on and on uh -huh. and on and on and be very chatty. I got the highest mark in that class. I could have hit that professor with my car. Right in the parking lot and you would have no idea who I was, but uh -huh. I got the highest mark in the class. Right. I understood the material very well. I just wasn't very comfortable talking in class, but now I teach right. classes right. where I really want people to participate. Uh -huh. So I very much try to focus on making a comfortable atmosphere where yeah. they don't feel threatened and feel able to participate. And, but there's some students who are just so paralyzed by that yeah. fear of speaking in front of other people. Well, and to me, I think there's a bunch of different ways of thinking about what participation mm -hmm. is. Like participation doesn't always look yeah. like, oh, me, me, I, yeah. you know. And so if there's other kinds of assignments, they well, participate in I always tell them if there's a class of 20 of us, only one person can be talking at a time and 19 of us should be listening. And that's participation. Right, right if you're yeah. listening and engaging, and I can yeah. see that. Right. And that's also sometimes when we provide online opportunities for students to engage. Uh -huh. There are a lot of students who are very shy about participating verbally, but have great things to say and can write them very right. effectively. And maybe need more time to think yeah. before they feel comfortable Absolutely. speaking, so they, they, they and just process And there are cultural differences around Absolutely. that as well, right? Uh, yeah. The kind of free-flowing kind of things that a lot of academics are very drawn to don't fit culturally. And, and so I think in terms of being culturally sensitive, providing people multiple ways of participating is important. Right. Well, that relates to one of the other things I wanted to bring up with you, which is empathy. Mm -hmm. I know that you, in your teaching award, you were, your empathy for students was singled out as one of your most distinguished characteristics. Um, uh, and I wanted to ask you, how do you show that empathy? Like, I think many of us feel empathy for our students, but, but how students know that we feel is tricky. Well, there's a difference between empathy and sympathy, right? Uh -huh. So empathy for me, well, where this came up is, uh, so I got a letter saying, oh, you've been nominated for the teaching award. Congratulations. Now you have to submit this massive dossier of things. So say goodbye to the next month of your life when okay. you compile all these things. And one of these things was a philosophy of teaching, which I'd written at various stages right. through my career. And I could have dusted off the one I did when I was promoted to full professor. But I thought, you know what? I've had some time. There's been some some time has elapsed and I want to, and I sat and really thought about what I learned about teaching and to me what it really came down to is I need to think what it was like for me to encounter things for the first time mm -hmm. and how challenging that is but also how exciting that is right uh, there's both those things and for me when I'm explaining uh, in first year political science what government is uh -huh. right um, I've done that dozens of times, right? So the thrill, in a sense, is gone for me. But remember what it's like for students and putting myself into their shoes so I don't go too fast over things that are foundational concepts. And as I thought more and more about it, I thought, well, that really is the key, right, is to think what it's like and what are the steps I need to take them through uh -huh. to get them to the point where they can understand. I also do try to be sympathetic, which is sort of feeling and caring about them and being concerned about them. And what struck me is, because the other thing you have to do for this dossier is get letters of support. Mm -hmm. So you reach out to some former students and ask them, would you be willing to write a letter? What was really interesting to me is the things that came back in the letters were often less about uh, times where I had made some brilliant insight, which was a little disappointing for me as a <laughs> professor, but more about Students would talk about, yeah. you know, I was in a car accident and I was really struggling. And Professor Jansen um, really worked with me to help me get through that really tough period of my life mm -hmm. and adjusted a bunch of assignments. And another student wrote about the time his computer crashed uh -huh. and he lost everything. And he had this giant paper in my fourth year seminar and I rearranged the entire class schedule to accommodate him to allow him to fix that. Those were the things the 
the students remembered were those the moments of kindness, yeah. right? Where you saw them as people who faced problems and you worked with them to solve them. That really struck me, actually. Uh -huh. That those were the things that stuck with them in the long run was those moments of kindness that you showed that you recognized they were people who mm -hmm. struggle with things. Yeah. Over my almost 20 years now doing it, I find, especially when I started, that kindness, kindness could read as um, weakness to the mm -hmm. students yep. and figuring out the balance of being re as kind as you can be and as empathetic yeah, yeah. and yet also um, rigorous, fair. right? Yeah. Rigor and, yeah fair yeah, and rigorous yeah. is a, a challenge. And me. there are lots of times where I've, I've had to say no to yeah, students, of, of right? Course. I remember this was early on in my career, a student came to me and said, oh, I don't have my paper, it was a Monday, I don't have my paper done, my family moved this weekend. And I said, like, did they just suddenly decide on Saturday, <laughs> hey, let's move. <laughs> right. I said, I'm gonna presume that this was in planning and I told you three months ago yeah, that this uh -huh. was due then, so I said, I'm sorry. I said, because I know there are other people right. who might have struggled and if I do this for you, I know for every one person who comes and talks to me, there are probably 10 who struggled yeah. and didn't come talk to me and right. found a way to get it done and probably also could have used yeah. the extra time. So in the interest of fairness, I had to say no. So there's that combination between yeah. sort of sympathy and, and fairness and yeah, procedural fairness. And it's a tricky line to walk. It takes some judgment mm -hmm. and getting to know students. But uh, the nice thing about being at a smaller university like the U of L is I often get to know students over time, right? And right because I have a relationship with them. And I know this one student's computer crashed. I know he, somebody who always, had never asked me for anything right. in, this, in the three or four classes he'd taken from uh -huh. me, always had everything done, yep. would take penalties, took responsibility. Right. And if he was asking me, I really believed that, yes, that was a real problem right. and we needed to accommodate it. Right. Well, and I think the other part of that that's clear in, your, in the way you relate to students is that you're often, um, spending a lot of time with them, like saying, come to my office hours, come, or, or come, you said, come see me about yeah, the yeah. work, right? Um, do, how, how do you make yourself available to students? Well, telling them that over yeah. and over and over and over again. Sometimes I will reach out to them individually. I will send them an email. Uh -huh. I will write it on as comments on an assignment, like, you really struggled with this, or you don't seem to understand this from what I can see. If you come to my office, I'm happy to go over it right. with you again. So a, a C with, yeah. you know, C just marked is one thing, and a C with you don't understand this specific yeah. thing, that's a really different Yeah, very, thing. very directive kind of feedback. This yes. is where you struggled. This is why you got the grade you did. Uh -huh. I can help you with that, but you need to come in to see me. Right. And the other thing, it's, it's a really small thing, but when I'm walking around campus, I try to walk through places where I know students are always walking, and I'm uh -huh. always looking for my students. Yeah. Yeah. Just to smile at them. Mm -hmm and say hi to them, right. chat with them, uh -huh. just to create that, I'm here, right, and I, I see you, I notice you. Yeah. I think that sends a message that we're available and open and care about them and, yeah. and notice them. Yeah. Um, university can be a really alienating place for a lot of students. It's big, mm -hmm. even a relatively small university like ours, it's a big and can be a lonely place, so I think that's a small thing we can do that makes a difference. I, I agree completely, I think. And I think that's one of the really special things about this university. Mm -hmm. it, it wasn't the case in the university that I came from that professors you know, look to engage with students mm -hmm. much. So Absolutely. yeah, I think it's a fabulous thing that you do that. In terms of the empathy and the, and the showing that you care about students, do you think that actually changes what they learn? Or do you think it just changes their comfort level here? Hmm, that's interesting. Um, what, I, what I think it does, when I have this relationship, I think students, I think it challenges them. I think in this weird sense, I think when, I, when I've sort of built this relationship with them, I think they really worry about disappointing me. Uh -huh. I think it's very motivating for them. Yeah. I've found in situations where I've been compassionate to students uh, and then they have fallen down from that. I mean, sometimes it can be difficult because they really feel they've let me down. Right. And I talk, no, like obviously your problems were so overwhelming. Like I get that. Yeah, some, tell them sometimes that. life's get it, yeah. gets in the way. And yeah. it does for all of us, right? Absolutely. But I, I think it I think it's very motivating yeah. for students when I yeah. show that I've really been there for them. I, I really do think that gets them to 
sort of engage at a higher kind of level and push themselves yeah. a little more. I'm pretty convinced of that. This is what I have come to believe too, that it doesn't just, it's, it doesn't just make the room nicer. Yeah. It makes actually the learning yeah. stronger and deeper. Teaching ultimately, when you think about it, is a relationship, right? Mm -hmm. I, I can't teach without students. Right. And students, I mean, I guess you can't be a student without a teacher, but in a way you can't. Even if the teacher is a book or a video, yeah. there is a teacher Somewhere. of some, right? So it's always defined mm -hmm. by that relationship. Uh -huh. And I think sort of tending to that relationship is important. And it, it doesn't mean, like, I mean, I, I don't socialize with my students. Some of them become friends over the years, uh -huh. and some become colleagues uh, over the years. But I don't spend a lot of time other than sort of chatting in the hallway as we right. go to movies together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But or drinking together. No, exactly. <laughs> no, no. I, uh, but I do feel we, we sort of have this relationship, yeah. and it, yeah. that's very important. And I, I think spending some time cultivating that and around the expectations of what yeah. that needs to look like. Uh, with graduate students, right, I'll always have a talk with them at the beginning about when I take a new graduate student on about our relationship. And there's mm -hmm. gonna be times where I'm going to have to push you and that we're not gonna like each other all the time. There's gonna be times you're frustrated with me because I'm pushing you to uncomfortable things. There's times yeah. you're gonna ask things of me that are going to be annoying to me because there's other things I want to do, but that's okay, right? And we need to talk about that and define those expectations. Yeah. So I think being sort of self-reflective about it and explicit about it, about what we ask of each other is important as uh -huh. well. Hard to be explicit sometimes until yeah. you've got the experience to um, troubleshoot before it arises. Uh, but I agree that's, that's uh, important. Your research includes people who used to be students here, your mm -hmm. research team. Um, and so that made me think about your, your um, graduate students and how do you find teaching changes over as students mature and become graduate students and maybe even colleagues? It's fun actually. Uh, mm -hmm. Earlier today I had a video conference with a former student of mine who were with a few other people writing a book together. And mm -hmm. uh, so this student, and I'll give a shout out, Royce Coop, who's now uh, the head of the political science department at the University of Manitoba, yeah. was a student here. My first year of teaching here, he was in first year of political science. Right. And I needed a research assistant uh, in my second year. So I employed Royce for a few years. And um, because he had really stood out to me, he was very interested and also very capable and very smart, clearly and very hardworking, right. something we often forget about <laughs> with students. It's not just raw intelligence, no. it's mostly hard work. Yeah. He worked with me and then showed a lot of promise, came up with a lot of his own ideas. So over time, what I found is that I um, basically could hand off more and more to him. I saw this maturity in him and I could push him more. Um, he became more of a colleague because at that time, our graduate program was very small, and in political science, we're a small department. It still is quite small. Mm -hmm. So the senior undergrads become very important to me. They're the closest right. thing I have to undergrad uh, to graduate students in a lot uh -huh. of cases. So I can ask tougher questions, more theoretical questions. We can right. get more methodologically sophisticated. So a few of them, we'd co-author papers together, and I'd mm -hmm. have them help me present them at conferences. Mm -hmm. And then when Royce went on to do his master's degree, we still wrote papers together. When he did his PhD, we wrote papers together. We've been together on two shirt grants now. Wow. So we've had this long-standing relationship uh -huh. for over 20 years, and wow. it came from my first year of teaching, he was in my Canadian politics class in his first year, uh -huh. in my first year here, and we've had this relationship over 20 years where we've gone from him being a student in a big class to we talk regularly and do research together. And that's really interesting yeah. and, and um, um, clear kind of success of our students, right? Well, and one of the things I think we do so well at the University of Lethbridge and we need to do more of and we need to tell this story more is that we get our undergraduate students involved in doing research um, I've mm. had parents at open house ask me, well, why should I send my kid to the University of Lethbridge rather than a the school. University of Calgary, yeah. right? And I'll say, you know what, the University of Calgary is a phenomenal school. Mm -hmm. Some of my best friends and favorite colleagues, including a former student of mine, mm -hmm. teach there. And it's right. a wonderful place. I said, but here's the thing I can tell you is that your student here might get involved in research in a way that only graduate students would at another right. university. It's a big advantage. They're going to leave here with hands-on experience doing things that most undergrads don't get a chance to experience. Yeah, I think that that is one of the best things about this program yeah. that 
especially if a student is very engaged. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they will have professors engaging with them. Um, and I've started to involve some of my senior undergrads in teaching, in teaching the first year class. Oh, really? I, yeah, uh -huh. so that's something I've also modeled after what I did at the Small Liberal Arts College was I got to do that. Yeah. It was such a great experience for me. So the last time I taught Local Science 1000, I recruited four of our fourth year students yeah. to help me teach it. So they had tutorial groups where they... Not just marking. No, they led... Uh -huh. uh, well, I did a training session, uh, a series of training sessions with them with the help of the teaching center. We worked together to uh -huh. equip them, give them skills, and then we had a series of readings we led them through, and I would meet with the tutors every week. We would discuss it together, and then they would lead the undergrads through it. Oh, neat. And I would sit in. I would rotate through them just to get a chance to listen in and watch my senior students do their thing and give them feedback so they develop teaching yeah. skills. Um, but it also, I was trying to create a smaller group experience in class that's gotten to be quite big. So, right. Yeah, so now I've also moved that not just in research, but on the teaching side, we can, I think, quite skillfully employ our senior students and help us with that part of our mission as uh -huh. well. I don't do that yet, but I will take that under advisement. I like it. Yeah, it I, it's I a use lot them of for work. marking. It's a lot of work up front yes. to prepare them because I, I mean, when I first taught as a TA in grad school, I was thrown to the wolves. Like mm -hmm. I remember when I was doing my master's, mm -hmm. I was basically told, oh, so there's a tutorial once a week. You have them do whatever you want. That yes. was all the guidance I had. Yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. I have a similar experience and, and similarly traumatizing. And I thought, uh -huh. I'm not doing that. I'm going to give them some tools and give them some guidance. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it was it was a pretty amazing experience. Like I, I loved it. And I uh -huh. loved those weekly meetings with those four tutors. They were so excited about right. the experience of getting to do this. Well, and it's such good preparation to get them thinking about the discipline in a different mm -hmm. way, right? It yeah. solidifies their base knowledge. It's really, it's yeah. good teaching. Yeah, absolutely. In, yeah. in multiple ways. Yeah, and I was very struck by like I'm sort of teaching multiple levels right I'm teaching them how to teach but to teach something you need to understand it very yes. well and so uh -huh. they had to be able to engage with the material at a level that was quite sophisticated and then we'd right. have to think well what's the best way to introduce this to a bunch uh -huh. of people who are new to these ideas for the first time and we talk very explicitly about pedagogical strategies that would be effective Right, so. which then prepares them for graduate school yeah, or, exactly. or other or, other parts yeah, of teaching life. Teaching comes in all kinds of places yeah. we do a lot of teaching in right. different ways your research also deals a lot with um, digital media and mm -hmm. new technologies. Does that come into your uh, teaching much? So I have a Twitter account, which I very sporadically use. Uh -huh. I'm mostly a consumer. Uh, mm -hmm. Twitter's become quite a toxic place with a lot of sexism and racism. It's not a place I feel comfortable. No, no. So I have very carefully curated lists that I just read, and I will uh -huh. occasionally post a promotional thing about something that's happening in the Faculty of Arts and Science. That's about the extent of it. So I don't actually use it. I don't uh -huh. interact with students very much, although I, I do have to say when, when the award got announced, a number of students, former students, reached out to me on Twitter and former colleagues. I had a lot of nice connections, even with students I taught as a graduate student wow. like uh -huh. 25 years wow. ago, which that was pretty neat to yeah, that's... reconnect. Where I do use it is you know, producing videos, I mean, right. they're stored on YouTube. But I have done things around blogging, where I actually had one, a couple of classes where rather than have the students write term papers, I had them blog about Alberta politics, and we opened it up to the public oh, wow. to comment on. And that was an interesting experience, uh -huh. because what had struck me reflecting on teaching is a lot of times by assigning term papers all the time, what I really felt I was assessing students on was how well they'd mastered this particular form of expression of ideas. Yes. And it was a very interesting thing to have them embrace blogging because it's a very different form of writing. And can you express those ideas in punchier, shorter pieces? Right. So I was separating the sort of ideas and the content from the particular form. And I was very struck a number of students who were really great term paper authors struggled uh -huh. with the blogging. And there were some students who I didn't think were that great students and they were incredible at blogging they could write these very succinct interesting uh -huh. points and what struck me is it wasn't that they didn't understand the material they just weren't very good at writing these formal term paper things that we assign as as um yeah. faculties and that we're very comfortable yeah. with but, well but that's an interesting part of um, your job as i understand it because as a political scientist you would be you know, writing the standard academic footnoted mm -hmm. papers, yep. but also I know you're, you have a sort of media presence and talk in quicker sound bites on radio or TV mm -hmm. interviews. So 
I mean, that doesn't happen in art history so often. Right. We don't get yeah. <laughs> <It's not> Sadly, <laughs> yeah. the world would be a better place. If, <laughs> oh, we need to hear from an art historian on, on this. Yeah. But like, so in a way, that's an interesting thing that your the blog assignment actually speaks to the necessity of your discipline to be able to write the academic paper, but also to speak in punchier sound bites. Well, and I, I told them as well, I said, it's very unlikely most of you are not going to get a job where they're going to say, here, write a 12 to 15 page paper on this, right? Mm -hmm. But you might get asked to contribute to a blog for your work, or you might want to start Absolutely. one, right? So learning yeah. how to communicate in that forum in a way that's sort of responsible and yeah. balanced, but still interesting and engaging is a skill. And like all skills, uh -huh. I mean, it takes practice. Absolutely. So, yeah, and then the engagement with the public part, that, that can be challenging as well. And it was interesting because I um, would basically curate all the comments. So I didn't completely have it open. People from the outside were welcome to comment, but I could shield and uh -huh. not approve the worst ones. But it was very interesting because I remember a student who um, had written something and somebody very cruelly in the comment, which I didn't pass on to the student, said, said, I can't believe you're a university student when your writing is so bad, right? Uh -huh. But that's actually a very powerful statement because we tell students all the time, you know, if you don't use complete sentences and your grammar's right. bad, people take you less seriously. Mm -hmm. There was tangible evidence. So I, sh I didn't attribute that comment to anybody, but I showed the comment to the class, not saying who it was directed right. at, right. saying, just so you know, like, this is why this matters. Right. And that's a very powerful lesson. I can tell them that all they want to. Uh -huh. but and the other thing that I like about, like, I'm very big on having students read each other's work, partly because a lot of times I see students write really amazing things, and I'm sad the only, I'm the only person who right. ever gets to read it. But I think it also really encourages them to be their best, right? right? Because it's one thing to not necessarily do as well for me, but it's mm -hmm. quite another thing to not do as well when everybody's reading it. So right. that's something I use in a few of my classes, where we write things for each other. Right. And uh, I have them read things I write in, and learning how to comment critically on work. And I will actually critique my own work. Uh -huh. And I will show them, here's what's wrong with this article. This was published, but there's a huge logical <laughs> flaw that none of the <laughs> reviewers picked some up bravery. on. And I'll just tell them, like, yeah. this is, see, can you, like, I'll yes. tell them, there's uh -huh. a problem in this article. Can right. you find it? The reviewers didn't. Uh -huh. Could you find the problem? And, and that, I mean, them. that's so yeah. empowering to yeah. a student, right, to, to put, Put them in that position yeah. of a critical thinker. But also, that can like all our, all our work, like I think in politics, we generally, in political discourse, there isn't enough humility in the kinds of claims we make in the show. <laughs> I've spent most of my life studying and writing about and thinking about politics, but I'm critical of my own conclusions. Right. And there's things I've spent way too much time thinking about than is healthy for most normal, well adjusted <laughs> people. And I'm not 100% sure about most of the things that I, even things I think, I'm. I'm not sure, and yeah. I want students to learn that as well. Oh, I think doubt is sorely lacking in our culture. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> Let's just be humble about what we know and our claims. And, right? yeah. yeah, and what we don't even know we yeah. don't know. Exactly, I, I agree. Yeah. I also wanted to talk about your new role. You've been an associate dean in arts and science for a couple Al of years no, now? No, almost a year. It's been... Oh, just a year. Uh -huh. Yeah, it was sort of a short-term emergency thing that's turned into a slightly longer yeah. thing, and we'll see how long that continues. And I mean, that's not a teaching role in mm -hmm. the formal ways we think of teaching, but has it changed your perspective on teaching? The hardest thing has been I miss... I'm teaching less. I only teach one class a year, and right. I, I miss... I miss being in the classroom as much yeah. as I used to. And I, what I really miss actually is walking around and seeing fewer students that I teach. Yeah. I actually recognize fewer faces and I find right. that kind of sad and I uh -huh. miss that. But what has really helped me understand is the broader context within which we work. I'm yeah. much more aware of the fact that resources are very scarce and uh -huh. um, how those resource decisions really affect what we do in the classroom. I work very hard to try to protect the importance of teaching and in the kinds of decisions that we have to make in the dean's office, a lot of times it comes down to, for me, what's in the best interest of our students, right? They have to come first. Right. Um, so sometimes that means protecting them from things that faculty want to do, and there are a lot of faculty who are very focused on research and mm -hmm. just keep, you know, the teaching part's a big part of why we're here. The research yeah. is important, absolutely, but we have these dual roles mm -hmm. and we can't neglect the teaching part, but also trying to do what we can to fight for the resources that 
make teaching possible, but it's mm -hmm. challenging. I mean, there's, there's a lot of demands. And I'm very struck, I guess I have a new appreciation for coming from as an instructor where I think my course is really important and being a department chair, well, my department's needs are right. really important. The fact that every department has needs that are very important mm -hmm. and often in the administration, I'm not saying, well, we have these 10 bad ideas and there's one good idea, but we have 11 really right. good ideas. Right. Where is it most needed? Where can we make the most difference? What can we do that's gonna have the biggest impact on students and, mm -hmm. and make it best for them? That's what I try to have guide me in the decisions we yeah. make, but it's challenging. I mean, university education, um, yeah, the, the money side of it matters, and we're under, we've been under significant resource constraint for most of the time I've been here, but right. uh, I'm very aware of that context now. I, I can imagine that that would shift some of, some of your viewpoints. And there are times where I've had to, we just don't have the resources to fund another section of a course and the class uh -huh. sizes have gotten bigger. And I'll which have, yeah, which impacts teaching. Absolutely, and, and I'll have instructors and department chairs make pedagogical arguments and I have to tell them, mm -hmm. I agree with you 100%, yeah. I'm just as sad as you are that we have to do this, but I think what we can't lose sight of is there are still lots of innovative things we can do, even in big classes. You do them in big classes. Mm -hmm. Lots of my colleagues do, and we can't just throw our hands up and right. give up. We have to do the best we can with what we've got, right. and we can't stop doing that. Uh -huh. and that's what I have to challenge my, right. my colleagues in the dean's office and uh -huh. in departments to do. And so how do you think people who are teaching big classes can make those what sometimes gets called high impact um, learning moments happen for students? What are some of the things you've done in your bigger classes? Well, I mean, part of it is that my having my senior undergrads chip right. in and help out, right, was partly motivated for me by the fact that I could see my classes creeping up in size, the resources weren't coming. Uh -huh. um, in my department, it's small. I don't have a big coterie of graduate students that I right. can throw at the problem, so I needed to be creative and think outside the box. That was one of my solutions. Uh -huh. I know a lot of professors do a lot of stuff where we do group work in class, right? right. Where you try to create that sense of community, and you can still do it in large classes, uh -huh. um, and then come back and report. There's a lot of innovative things that we're doing. And yes, there are a lot of work, and we have to think outside of just standing in front of the class and the way we deal with larger classes is just speak a little louder because we're lecturing to more people. <laughs> Right? That's, right, that's the yeah. response uh -huh. for, oh, okay, I will have one less essay question or I'll yeah. just switch to multiple choice. Uh -huh. That's one way to cope, but I think we need to be a whole lot more creative than that and think about, are there ways to deploy technology, right? right. Are there ways to, ways to discuss things online, for example, mm -hmm. through our Moodle or some other platform where we can engage with each other because it's harder to have a discussion with 150 students in your class than it is with 60. Right. Um, maybe we start looking at things like that. But the point is we need to never stop trying to look yeah. for those things to maintain the quality even in the face of resource shortfalls. Well, and I'm always struck by when you talk to instructors, they, m most of the instructors that I know care deeply about their students mm -hmm. and, the, and the learning. And they are trying to figure out, okay, you know, here's what I've done. Most of us have a, quite a few tricks that yep. we've got to um, shift the syllabus from, you know, it used to be X number of essays and they've gotten a little bit shorter because yep. of the marking requirements, yep. but um, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's, there's all kinds of stra and That's why it's important for us to keep talking to each other, mm -hmm. right, through the teaching centers, through other forums that, uh, and that's part of because I'm in the dean's office now, I see what lots of different departments are doing and mm -hmm. I can tell them you should talk to this person because right. they, face that problem, here's the solution that they had, maybe that would work for you, maybe not. Right. But I can help make those connections, which uh -huh. is a nice position to be in. In terms of the teaching center, you've been involved with the teaching center now for maybe Over since Over a decade, it's, yeah. not quite, yeah, since before it was the teaching center right. when it was under its old name, yeah. What are some of the projects you've done with the teaching center? Well, I was a teaching fellow, I was board teaching chair. Um, so some of the things I've been involved with, uh, the graduate uh, student's um, preparation course. Right. Uh, there's a section on class discussions, and if you look at the curriculum on that, that came from a presentation that I started doing to graduate students in the teaching center around okay. how to lead class discussions, because right. that's a big part of what we do in yeah. uh, political science. 
Uh, I've been really involved in, and probably my biggest thing I've been involved with is around space. Right. And how we can make our classrooms more effective learning spaces. And what's really nice is now in the dean's office, I actually have that portfolio. So I oh. sit, I represent the Faculty of Arts and Science on several of these committees, which is exciting to me because uh -huh. now I get to talk to the people who make those decisions and can. Yeah. I get taken a little more seriously now because I'm not just a regular <laughs> professor, but I have the might such as it is of the dean's office behind right. me. Right. Um, so that's something that really matters to me because a lot of classroom spaces are designed by people who never teach or learn in them. Right, or they're designed for an older model. Yeah. I, I oh, have been absolutely. teaching in E690, which oh. is, I believe, statistically proven to be the most hated yeah, yeah, course absolutely. on the room yeah. on campus. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it's a challenge to do things like group learning in there for oh, because of the setup, but yeah. we make it it's work. It's challenging to do any kind of learning in that classroom, yeah. but um, yeah, my plan yeah. for that is right. we should pave it over and salt the earth and yeah. never speak of that room ever again. Yes, um, <laughs> I think I agree, but I do, I mean, but you if you're assigned work, right? in it, you yeah, do no, kind of absolutely. think, okay, like, here's how. Well, and that's the thing um, I've found, though, is that a lot of times instructors, if you're determined, you'll make things succeed despite yeah. Yeah. the roadblocks, just like yeah. students do. They face challenges and they find ways to right. get what they need to done. And as instructors, like I said, we throw our hands up or I guess the way I get up in the morning and can sort of live with myself is uh -huh. always, I have to do the best I can. I can sit and just despair over, oh, I've got more students in my class. Well, I, we always wish our classes were smaller, right? I'd rather have 20 mm -hmm. students than 40. I'd rather have 40 than 60, but this is what I have. Yeah. And I'm gonna do the best and make this the best possible experience for my students. Yeah. And, and yeah, this isn't the classroom I would prefer, but how can I make it work, right? right? So space has been a big thing I've done with the teaching center and yeah several presentations at various kinds of things and right. uh, i just think it's important that we keep talking about what we're doing and keep pushing each other to be better and it's a fabulous community if there are faculty who have not gotten involved they've missed out to me one of the most rewarding parts of uh being at this university i i thought my career i'd almost divided into two parts there was pre-teaching center and post-teaching center really? when i discovered that yeah. My, I enjoyed my time at the university so much more. I got to know, to me, the really interesting faculty members mm -hmm. and other uh, departments and other faculties I never would have met any other way and right. made some great friends that way. So it changed my career. It's, yeah. it's, I cannot say enough good things about it. I agree, of course. I, I love the teaching center. But I also find for me, one of the things that really benefited when I started foregrounding thinking about teaching in my own work is that it went from being it's off, teaching is often seen as sort of the lesser yes. cousin to research yeah, absolutely. and when you start thinking okay well it's going to take up close to half my time anyways it might as well be like really great time yes. <laughs> um, and uh, working with the teaching center allowed me to figure out how to make it really great time um, absolutely no it's a big part of our job it's half yeah. the job right and the other thing, that, that's also what led me to looking at research on teaching, right? Because uh -huh. I wouldn't do my research without looking at what are good practices around right. how to research digital media uh -huh. and politics, right? What have other people done? What's worked and what's not? Yes. Why would we not take our teaching that seriously as well, right? I want to uh -huh. do it well. Have you been involved in, have you, I, you mentioned a few times in this conversation that you've looked at research on teaching. Do you also? I do a little bit. I don't. I, I will confess to having sort of a, some skepticism around some of it uh -huh. because I teach research methods and some uh -huh. of the scholarship I'm teaching and learning is... Um, a discipline in its infancy. Yes, would be a nice, <laughs> that's a very kind way of putting it. I was going to be much less kind, but, um, but some of it is what I did on my summer vacation kind yes. of research, right? Is yes. basically, and oh, I, I did that's, this. Well, and that's, that's the where starting we start. Point, yeah, right? right? It's like, exactly I tried it. something and it worked. And for me, it's like, well, I'm looking for, oh, I only have a sample size of this much, and right. there's all these methodological problems uh, with it. But I try to be very systematic in the kind of evidence I gather. So uh -huh. I, I do surveying of students, right? I right. want to find out what's working, what's not. Mm -hmm. I actually look for relationships between things and I'll correlate with how they did, right? If students tell me they did this and this, did they do better, right? right. I want to actually see that. Um, I look at when I'm going to try something new, I look at the research on it. Does that actually, do I have a reasonable expectation that that's going to make a difference yeah. or not? 
And then you quantify it in courses. Yeah, and sometimes it's not quantifiable or the sample right. size is so small and I have to go by gut uh -huh. instincts. I also really want to hear what my students think, right? right. So this I try to talk with them a lot. Uh -huh. um, I, so and you I don't... want to always have them, is this working, is this not? What's working for you, what's uh -huh. not? I'm always checking back with them. Feedback is something Professors are often very, um, feedback can be complicated when you're a professor because it, yeah. is, it is often it anonymous. Yeah, and, yeah, it, and, yeah, it can, yeah. and it can be inappropriate sometimes yeah. and other things. Um, but like you, I have also f found that it's incredibly valuable, um, as and especially if it's directed. So, how do you solicit feedback? Like, I, I usually go to classes early and mm -hmm. I will chat with them before and I will ask them, right? I'll, and I will, like, how is that working? Mm -hmm. Did you understand that? what's not working, I'm always asking them to okay. tell me. And I find, and I, the other thing I always tell them is that, sure, you're gonna have the course evaluation at the end. It's but too, I said, it's, it's too late, it's too late. late. <laughs> I always tell them that. If I'm not speaking loudly enough, don't tell me in the course evaluation. Yeah. Tell me now. Right. I can fix it. Don't suffer through yeah. class because that's great. Next next year's class will learn, will benefit from that. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you benefit from that? Right. So I do that, and I find students, once you sort of show that you're open and you're responding, and I make uh -huh. it very clear, a student emailed to tell me that, so I'm doing this, I show right. that I'm listening uh -huh. to them and changing something in yeah. response to their feedback, and then they start giving me more of it. Right. And I've had students, I've had midterm exam that was just a, just a train wreck. My mm -hmm. questions were horrible. It was awful. It's hard to I'd, make good questions sometimes. Oh, it's terrible. <laughs> right. I'm still really bad at it. And they, <laughs> I don't believe that. <laughs> and they, but they'll email and tell me that, would, like, I love this class, but this exam was terrible because of this and this right. reason. Or, yeah, you're right. Yeah. So I will tell uh -huh. them that. But the feedback is, uh, I have found that that's a big shift for me too. Yeah. Show, asking for feedback early yeah. in term, yeah. um, it changes how they. Think about the process yeah. and makes yes. I, for me, it's been quite. And I know a lot of a lot of colleagues, and I've occasionally done this. Will do like surveys and stuff. But to me, yeah. I really like to know where it came from. Like uh -huh. the anonymous thing is not as useful to me because I know certain students yeah. who I know are there and in front and engage when they're the ones who are telling me there's a problem. Right. Boy, I take that seriously. Right. 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 I really, really do. Now I realize there's some students who are quiet and shy uh -huh. and reluctant to tell me. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's that's hard, but I do. And sometimes I'll, yeah. in a big class, I'll walk towards the back and strike up conversations right. with students and sit in the back. I'll go ten minutes early and just yeah. ask how it's going and just ask them how school's going and just try to build that right. connection that with relationship. them. That relationship. Yeah. I know you've also been involved in uh, things like gi the giving out of the Board of Governors Research or Teaching Awards, um, and you're involved in assessing good teaching in that sense. So. Does that give you some perspective on what makes good teaching? or? I think it ultimately comes back to that feedback thing. Like um, I've sat on several salary tenure and promotion committees. Right. So when uh, faculty are getting tenure or getting promoted, demonstrating teaching effectiveness is a big part of that. So right. that always raises the question, what makes good teaching? And to me, what it comes down to is not necessarily professors getting bad feedback, because we all get bad feedback. Um, to me, it's how stu teachers respond, how professors respond. And the good ones are always looking at, what could I have done better? Right. right. How can I improve? And it's how you respond. And sometimes students will say, I really hated that assignment. Uh -huh. And it doesn't necessarily mean, good teaching doesn't necessarily mean, oh, students, I'm sorry, you didn't like that. I will give you something you would rather do. But right. it's, no, I still think this is important. So I'm going to respond to you. Responding to you is not necessarily doing what you want, mm -hmm. but I may need to explain it better, why we're doing it. Um, I, I may need to make that more effective for you, uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'm, I'm going to right. agree all the yeah. time. So to me, good teaching is about constantly assessing what we're doing, always trying to improve, and responding to our students, what they're telling us. Like I said, responding isn't doing what they want, right. but it's taking it very seriously. And if we can't do what they want, it's explaining why not, and being a little more uh, explicit about why we're doing what we're doing. So to me, it's that constant self-reflection and self-criticism, yeah. which is also what makes good researchers, right? Professors right. should be really good at that yeah. if we take the teaching part as seriously as our research. Uh -huh. I agree completely. I think that that's a key for both parts of our job. And I think that's a great place to wrap up. Thank you so much for being here. I'm 
so happy to be able to learn from you today. Um, and I look forward to seeing what other teaching awards you get in the future. Thanks, <laughs> thanks for having me. Great.